welcome to another episode of Design Under Influence. It's a pleasure to be here in front of you. And uh, today we have an awesome guest. Um, not only my co-host, Boris Rappaport, CEO of RKIT. Boris, say hi. Hi, everybody. And, and typically it's a duo, right? But today we brought Jennifer Kretschmer in. She's an architect, awesome person. And we met at the AIA um, Silicon Valley event just recently. Imagine that, you know, face-to-face -face event. Um, and okay. then we we talk, started talking about remote work and some of the interesting things that Jennifer has done in her career, um, building her business, uh, being 100% remote since, wait for it, 2008. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Alex. And thank you, Boris, for having me here today. I should also add that, you know, you're, you are contributing to uh, to the community in, in a lot of ways, more ways than just running your business. You were past president of AIA Silicon Valley, and you also uh, lead green associate. We might talk a little bit more about that if we have a chance. Um, but anyway, it's, it's, it's really great to have you. I have your website pulled up here. It's really nice. Um, looks like you run a pretty tight business. So tell me about the, maybe tell our audience and, and Boris and I, like what, what prompted you to do remote complete remote back in 2008? Well, that's an easy answer. It was the Great Recession. So mm -hmm. I saw the writing on the walls and where we were going. And paying rent was a, you know, big expense, um, a lot of overhead. And so I made the decision that I didn't want to have that office anymore. It was just the two of us. And, and at, at the time, I actually did have one uh, remote staffer um, who had started with me in 2005. Um, he is still working for me <laughs> to this day. Uh, so I guess really we were a team of three um, with the one remote staffer. So I made that decision. It was a completely a financial decision and to try to survive the Great Recession. And um, I was very happy that I did it. Um, I moved my entire business into my garage, very Silicon Valley style, right? <laughs> putting my business in the garage and, um, you know, worked there. Uh, it's my regular office space and had clients come, come to the garage, um, uh, from time to time and back in, in, and then in 2015, I made the decision that I was tired of looking at the cars. Um, <laughs> so I remodeled the space, um, and now it is, a, a an accessory dwelling unit, um, with, uh, you know, has a bathroom and has a kitchenette and everything in it, but it's completely dedicated to the business and working remotely. I do not bring clients here anymore. Um, we have other places to meet um, and we can talk about that more about how, how we're meeting with clients. That's a great, I'm taking that note, but those of you who are watching or those of you who are reading and maybe just listening, uh, it's worth, uh, it's worth going to YouTube and popping that play button for a sec, just to see Jennifer's background. Cause we talked about, uh, by that pre-show, there's a lot of cool stuff. Like you made it a dedicated space that that sort of, I guess, enhances the outward perception of who you are when you go out on zoom with people. But it also, I bet like it, it's like energizes you. I mean, because you designed it exactly the way you, you want it, right? Yeah, exactly. And and I do a lot of accessory dwelling units right now. So now when someone says, well, what can an accessory dwelling unit mm. look like? I just go, well, look behind me. <laughs> so yes, um, that, that's been great. It's it's very cool. You know, I, I, I'm so passionate about develop, designing spaces that um, sort of enable your creativity, your focus, whatever you, you name it, it enables it and you can design it to enable that, whatever that is. The one thing Boris and I keep talking about, he is like, I don't know, he is super productive and incredibly focused on the couch with kids running around, a bird singing and, 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 and like four people on Zoom and it still gets stuff done. Boris, I don't know how you do it, man. Um, have you thought about dedicated space for yourself? I've always thought about that. It's just, uh, yeah, we're, we're working in that direction, Alex. So thanks. <laughs> thanks for mentioning. 
right. Yeah. And back when this space was just a garage, like sometimes I would be too embarrassed and I would bring clients into my dining room instead. But yeah, <laughs> when I started working um, remotely in at home, basically in 2008, I had very young children too. So yeah, I was bright in that phase with the kids running around the dining room table and trying to give, get them focused on something else if I had to have a client come by. So having the dedicated space made a huge impact on my productivity um, and also just kind of a, the the rules about with the family as to when they can interrupt me, when they cannot interrupt me, right? So yeah. I think the biggest, I think getting things done is very possible, even, even when things are just kind of nuts, because typical, typical office is like, you always get interruptions. So, so I guess that, that maybe like feels the same when you're at home, you're getting interrupted. I think it's just what's, what's impacted is deep work and just, just sort of like subconscious uh, ability to, to create and, and, and sort of like think about things deeper and evaluate things deeper. But, you know, let's talk about your business a little bit, because you know, for the audience, who, people who don't know you, can you tell us a little bit about like how, what sort of architecture you focus on, what kind of clients you're looking to bring in, what kind of team you have, and then we go right slide into like, how do you deal with client meetings and such? Sure. So my architecture firm is named after me, Jay Kretschmer Architect. Um, we are a residential custom residential architecture firm. We do some small tenant improvements, but it is not our core uh, work that we do. Our work is primarily residential, mostly single family, but we do multifamily um, regularly. We do accessory dwelling units. Um, and we are also working on uh, senior housing projects. Uh, so it, it, pretty much anything residential we will we will work on. Our, our team, I team is made up of independent contractors um, and myself. So we, I have five licensed architects um, that work for me and one person who is not licensed. He's the one who's been with me since 2005. Um, and uh, we utilize technology to its fullest for task management um, and communication and productivity in order to have, you know, be more efficient and be able to have everybody know what they need to do. It is a very task oriented office rather than an hours oriented office um, to ensure that everyone has that flexibility in their lifestyle. Um, as long as people make deadlines, um, it doesn't matter to me when they choose to work or where they choose to work. Hmm. And again, they're all independent contractors. Yeah, and I bet that's that has that's a positive impact on, on people when when you get to choose where you work. That's that's among like when people define what does your rich life look like. For some people, it's you know billions of dollars. For some for other people, it's like choose when I am productive and creative. And other times, you know, I when I don't feel like it, I'm not just not I'm not going to do it. And that's that's I think that's a big one uh, to attract good people. So that's a side note, um, personal experience. Um, but but as far as like meeting clients, let's talk about now the client facing has to be a little bit more professional. You know, clients expect you expect results. And, and so they a lot of times they would judge by you know, your appearance, how your company presents itself, your website, all those things. How do you yeah. deal with that? Yeah. Um, when I had an office, um, and since most of my clients are single family residential projects uh, are owners of these homes, I found that sometimes they actually felt a little intimidated by coming into a, a traditional mm -hmm. architecture firm. So I started meeting with some of them at their homes or their businesses. I do gauge what kind of a client they are through our initial conversations. If it really looks like they want that professional office atmosphere, I mean, that meets their expectation. I have a co-working space that I'm a member of. Mm -hmm. Um, and we can, I could rent a conference room whenever I want or use the open space. Um, and it actually provides that, that bigger architecture firm look, even though there's varying businesses of different types of businesses within the co-working space. I found it very useful to have the, the um, receptionist at the co-working space, you know, it, it 
say hello to my client, ask them if they want coffee, and then take them to the conference room where I'm already waiting. I mean, that just feels like the whole regular office experience, but it's, you know, something I pay like a gym membership. Hmm. The rest of the time, um, very often we meet at the property um, or at the client's home. Uh, a lot of the clients I have work for pretty big companies. Um, one of my clients, one of my favorite client meetings is a client who works at Netflix. Um, they have great facilities there. And he just says, just come over to Netflix and we'll meet there. As long as I can somehow set up my computer, um, uh, again, as a remote worker, I keep everything on a laptop. Um, so I am always, always have the ability to be mobile. So as long as I can connect that up um, and be able to do a presentation with them with whatever they have there as a screen, it doesn't matter to me whether it's at their office or um, at my place. Um, I do have the facilities here in my ADU to also do presentations on a large screen. Um, it's just since the pandemic, I haven't had anybody come and visit me here in the office. But prior to the pandemic, I would sometimes have people come here um, and, uh, and meet with me in this space. Gotcha. So essentially, you meet them at the property, you gauge how they sort of uh, prefer to communicate and their preferred method. You meet them at the property, you you impress them with your co-working space, um, which is the investment you're making. But that makes sense for some of the people, some of the more, I guess, uh, people who are kind of used to that sort of communication. And then and then or you meet them at their office, which is sometimes nice. Yeah. yeah. Always gauging what the client expects, what their client expectations are. That's that's great. That's a really that's a really good advice. Start a relationship with good foot. Speaking of that, um, as a growth, as a business growth, I guess uh, somebody who's passionate about business growth um, and always fascinated uh, by seeing how other companies do it. What what some of the uh, maybe one or two top sources where you your clients find you? H how are you getting found? Is your website doing the the work? Is the Google doing the work? Is the referrals all of the above? Yeah, that's a great question because when I started out, it was primarily referrals. But today, the Google SEO um, is where a lot of people find me. I also have partnerships with the city of San Jose um, and with some other uh, websites that get great traffic. And so then they can find me through those websites um, as well. Uh, social media. Uh, next door has been really good to mm. me. Clients like to say, hey, I did, you know, I did this with this architect. Um, and so I do know I'm listed in several neighborhoods. I do not have a paid account with uh, next door. It's free, um, but I am getting referrals through there. Um, House.com used to be a very good referral source for me. They changed some of their algorithms, so I don't think people are finding me like they used to. Um, that is a paid service um, when you're using a house um, for the referral source. Um, so finding the right websites that uh, target your correct clientele um, mm. is, is vital. But the best thing is a good website with a blog, with good keywords, um, and I also use Google AdWords. Uh, so those seem to be right now where most people are finding me because I do ask everybody every time uh, they pick up the phone or they email me or whatever, how did you find me? Um, and I think that's a good business metric in any business is to remember to ask people when they find you, where did they find you from? so that you can keep those those metrics yeah that is that is great your website by the way i can tell you definitely invested some thought into it and like it, it's it's presenting very well it's not intimidating some websites are so fancy um and i think they're like they're not doing any favors well maybe they're targeting corporate clients but your clientele is is a single family you know owner so you got to be really kind of specific that so as, as a as a kind of a marketing uh, person, I really, I really appreciate that thought. Um, yeah, thank you. That you've put into it, and it's, it's still nice. It has really nice design elements to it. I'm looking at it right now. And those of you who are curious, 
go to, well, we'll link it out, uh, jkretschmer.com, uh, and then uh, just check it out for yourself. That's it's, it's a great job you've done here. So you mentioned blog. I know we're talking remote, but I just want to take for a minute about the blog. What you found, what, what's some of the topics that you cover that you found most helpful in client acquisition? Uh, well, I started out my blog actually just reposting articles that I had written for the San Jose Mercury News when I was one of their writers under their Ask an Expert. Um, and so I just reposted those and then continued to add blogs that basically came from questions that clients had asked me. So it sort of still continues that ask an expert type format. Um, and I think if you really deep dive into all of my website, you'll see that the kind of the branding or the intent is I am here to help you. Here are ways that I can help you. Um, and you can get them free right off of my website and then come and talk to me about your project. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm trying to do through the whole website and the blog is the theme is, is that I'm here to help you. Um, and uh, so every time I write a blog, it is how can I help someone today, you know, in architecture through the questions that they are asking. So uh, all of the blogs relate to that. Yeah. And that's, that's the stark difference between look at me versus how can I help? Exactly. That is definitely one way that I decided consciously and intentionally mm -hmm. uh, to set myself different from other architecture firms because you do go to architecture firm websites and there does seem to be a template of what they all look like. Oh, it's like, Hey, look at me, look at, just look at what I do. I mean, uh, and the ones that still have flash just drive yeah. me nuts. Flash photography. <laughs> oh, just, here's my project, my project, my project, my project. There's more my project, my project, my project. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and, you know, we do, we as a team, we do great work. Um, we have really good reviews and testimonials um, from our clients that we've also put on our website. Um, but that's not like, again, like that, that's not the focus of the website. It's not look at me. Um, and that's also why the motto for my company is realize your vision. Mm. Uh, I, it's not about me. It's about the client. Yeah. That's refreshing, Jennifer. That's really cool. Um, now, Boris, if you don't mind, can you take the next few minutes and let's, um, Let's, Jennifer, if you're willing to share, um, let's talk about the tech stack, we call it, or, or the technology you use to enable your successful operation in completely remote environment. Boris, if you want to take that, because I think, I think that would be more on, in your realm and sort of like, let's list things. Yeah. So, uh, Jennifer, I think my, my first question would be, well, in 2008, right, it's not today remote work was something that is non-existent or very limited, you know, existed in a very limited capacity. So there weren't any blueprints uh, for any small businesses to do this. Um, how did you develop, I guess, develop your processes? Because you had to basically do it from scratch. Yeah. So I looked at how communication is done. So communication was the number one key, communicating with me, communicating with my clients. How would I do that with the technology that was currently available in 2008? And back then it was really mostly email and phone, still some faxing, <laughs> um, but generally email and phone. And so it was very important that anyone who worked for me could talk the language of architecture because there was no way of pointing at pictures, you know, or pointing at our plans to each other. We had to describe things to each other as we were individually looking at our CAD system. So having a good process for communication. So things would come up like an email and says, oh, I really need to talk to you about this. I have this issue. Let's, let's talk about it. Well, I had the same processes with clients, um, but we did have more forward facing meetings um, with the clients at that time. That's kind of how we started out very little in the text, uh, tech stack besides email. <laughs> awesome. As you evolved and as the business evolved, and as we got new technologies, I guess maybe, well, give us what you, you know, what you're doing right now. 
uh, mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, the systems that you're using for a communication, as, as you said, that's probably the most important thing, mm-hmm. but um, collaborating in other ways as well, right? Either real time, maybe design or, yeah, just give us some, some, some things that you're doing right now with technology. Right. Um, as technology improved and we had better ways um, of communicating with one another and visualizing architecture um, in the you know, virtual and design realm, I started a more purposeful decision on systems um, assist- and systems that would be scalable. Because when I started this out, I really only had one person working for me on the architecture side. Um, And so we had worked together for such a long time, we could communicate with each other and have, you know, almost like telepathic conversations. Um, But around 2016 was when I started bringing in more people. Um, And we started out, I started out with a combination of hybrid where um, the new person would be working here with me. I do have two desks here um, until they learn the ropes and then they would be fully remote. And through that time started developing um, uh, CAD standard manuals um, that I put up on Google sites privately. Um, I still maintain that on a Google site as kind of the office manual, office standards, business plan production, anything that that any of my team members I feel is important for them to know in order to when they are working with other clients of mine, they we have a uniform look. Um, uh, so I also began using Podio. Um, so I had Citrix branded products, Podio, ShareFile, um, Write Signature. Um, so Write Signature is for e-signing documents. Um, so signing contracts or signing applications from permitting, all that signature stuff goes through Write Signature. Um, share file where we share our, our stagnant files um, before we were able to do things uh, more virtually on the cloud with our CAD systems, but because we were saving files stagnantly and then moving them between each other. Um, share file for that. But most importantly is Podio. Um, Podio we use as our task management um, and also as sort of a communications uh, way. It's sort of Podio came before Slack or Basecamp. And so it, it has kind of in it like a Slack or Basecamp like way of communicating with one another if we need to communicate with someone really quickly um, and uh, don't want to send an email. But it also has something that I did very specific to my company since I use independent contractors. I want them to select the projects that they're going to utilize or they want to work on um, and then send me a proposal um, for their work. Uh, so I have something I call a job board. Um, it has all our projects on it. Um, and each project has all of the contract information that anyone needs to know, including the budget the you know, for a number of hours or whatever it would take to do the project um, so that everybody, and then it has uh, also tabs on it that says ready for assignment so that someone knows that it's up for them to choose um, or in progress um, or on hold if, if for some reason the client holds it. So all the information is in this sort of this job board. Um, and once I did that, that made the process a lot more scalable to get more people involved, especially as independent contractors, because they'll be able to come up on here and see what projects are available once they're on my team. I've only had once where I had a couple of team members um, actually bid against each other on a project. <laughs> Most of the time, though, even though it's up there for them to make that conversation with me as to whether they want the project or not, most of the time I do select people based on their skill level and their uh, the tasks that they've done in the past as to whether they would be compatible with working with me and that client on that project. But every once in a while, I get a bidding process um, on a project. I, I want to pause here for just a sec. I'm just amazed. Like you build your own marketplace. <laughs> It's Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. You, uh, is this common? It, well, it's not, it's not common. Uh, do, are other people doing it or this is your innovation in some ways? I think this is a little bit more my inner in innovation, but there are products out there that do um, exactly uh, 
uh, all of this that are more current that have come out since the pandemic. And this is pre-pandemic that I've been utilizing these processes. Podio is kind of like a little bit of like Trello or um, uh, Monday um, in that that mm-hmm. that task management system and and attaching files to it. Um, but I think I the, the way that I do this job board, I, I don't know anybody else who did, does this job board like I do. Uh, but I also know very few who, rely 100% on independent contractors. Hmm. So my model is pretty different from a lot of people. But that's another innovation. This way, you're so nimble, you can control costs. When, you know, when, when things get tight, you can scale down when things are great, you can scale up. That is pretty brilliant way to to manage um, and have, you know, full nights of sleep. Mostly, Thank right? you. You sleep well. <laughs> I do sleep well. Thank you. That is exactly though why I why I I set it up that way because uh, in, uh, quite frankly, having a lot of employees scares me, and I'm the kind of person that even though they're independent contractors, if I can't get them the work that they expect from me, I do feel it. I really feel sure. bad that I can't get that to them. Um, so I can't I, I can't imagine. I mean, I like I said before, before 2008, between 2005, 2008, I did have employees and having to let, let them go, um, and either transition them as remote independent contractors or completely let them go was, was very difficult. And I didn't, don't ever want to have to do that again. Um, so there are days though, that I do wish I had employees because as independent contractors, I cannot control a lot of things that they do, cannot control their schedule, cannot supervise every daily what they're doing. Um, I still am supervising because I'm becoming the architect of record of all of these projects. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I still have the supervisor role in a way, um, with that, but like, I can't control their day to day, day lives. And sometimes I just have to wait for things to come to me. You know, if a deadline slips, there's no real consequences for them. Yeah. So there's, there's always, you know, two sides, but, but, right. um, you know, sleeping is also important. So that's, <laughs> you know, I, I think that's yes. a- And I'm very lucky that the people who are working for me now are quite dedicated to our processes, even though they have their own projects. So it's another thing with independent contractors, especially in California, they have to have their own businesses and they have to be doing their own projects. They can't be working solely for me. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, that's that's why schedules may, you know, be very in flux a lot. Um, but I am very lucky that the people working for me right now are very dedicated, um, to, to my entire team. So, yeah, no, fantastic. No rent, uh, scalable team, scalable tech. Great. I interrupted you on the tech. Um, I just don't want to miss anything. So let me just repeat what I've heard so far, because we want to kind of build a, uh, you know, Jennifer's, uh, uh, tech stack list, and then hopefully that helps other people. Um, but so, so CAD standard manuals on Google sites that helps kind of standardize processes on as far as architecture goes, but right signature for signing things, share file, you're not using that as much anymore or not at all. I'm actually using it quite a bit, but what we have started transitioning into is that our CAD, CAD BIM system, I'm not using Revit. I'm actually using Vectorworks Architect. Um, and they now have a pretty robust cloud platform um, that can allow multiple users to work on the same file at the same time, which we didn't have that opportunity. It can't, it can't, you know, whenever new tech comes into play, I don't jump in on it. I've been using Apple products for a lifetime. Um, so I'm never the f- first version. And it has been out, the cloud for Vectorworks has been out for a few years, we just haven't adopted that because I wanted someone else to work out the bugs. <laughs> so, um, but we're we're transitioning to to doing that more, and then we'll use Sharefile more for backing up. So part of our processes is that I do ask my independent contractors every Friday, whatever they've been working on that week, back it up on Sharefile. If you've been working on it independently from the cloud. Um, or whatever documents so that we don't lose anything <laughs> if someone loses their computer or laptop or whatever. So, um, so yeah, so that's how we use that. So we have Vectorworks cloud is in our stack as well. Um, 
we I started with G Suite, um, and now G G Suite has worked moved to Google Workspaces. So I use Google Workspaces. I use that both with my uh, workers, but also with my clients in communicating with them certain documents. Um, I keep a list of everything that they've been selecting as far as interiors and appliances and fixtures and, you know, windows and things like that. I keep this running list, um, uh, on the, on the cloud in Google workspaces. So mm. it's a Google doc. We use Google docs. We use Google, uh, spreadsheets and, and all of that. Podio, of course. And, and then Podio, yeah. Yep. And and then what else? What's some other, maybe some other systems, either communication, collaboration, file sharing, or uh, I don't know, payment processing, anything like that? Oh, that's a great point. Um, so I'm using Square primarily for my payment processing. My bank last year uh, put Zelle up. Mm -hmm. um, so clients are paying me via Zelle. We still every once in a while have to do old fashioned checks, but um, I'm more and more we're just doing things um, online. Uh, I use QuickBooks um, as our uh, as our financial system. Online or you, you have a, a local I'm still desktop. using the desktop. Oh, you're still desktop. Because okay. when I was using the online version when it was new, once again, I don't like being a beta tester. I, I could get things, things, my checks weren't printing out correctly. There was a whole bunch of issues mm. and, um, and I just thought it was too young. So maybe in the future we'll move to QuickBooks. Um, I'm investigating other products like Monograph, FreshBooks, and uh, Wait, so you, you are using fresh books i actually want to know i am not using it i'm currently vetting more software oh, so i I'm, thought you said i'm investing meaning like time investing or money i don't know i didn't know but okay i got I'm you you're looking at fresh books <laughs> i have to i peaked but i keep coming back to quickbooks online as, as sort of like everybody's using it it's that's what the cpa is like right so that's, <laughs> that too like uh, you know and then My there's CPA, BQE yeah. Core, right? BQE Core is one that's very popular among architects. Yeah, but so so it's interesting because um, some of the tools that you mentioned, like Monograph and BQE Core, I mean, their main, I guess, purpose is to be project management software and time uh, billing software, and then it's invoicing and everything else, right? But it sounds like you already have a system for project management and the task, um, you know, task. Um, marketplace that you've built yourself. So uh, how, I guess, how, how do you see what would be additional benefits from using BQE Core or Monograph versus what you already have? Um, I think it's because a lot of the things that I'm using are uh, different systems compartmentalized and Core and particularly Core and Monograph are more integrating a lot of those things into one package. Um, and you know, if I could write my own, <laughs> I <laughs> totally would, <laughs> but, um, but that is the big, the, my job board is so important that that's the big thing that holds me back from transitioning to any of these other things. Um, and then for visualization with clients, mm -hmm. um, I'm using Miro, um, and we also use that a bit uh, with the design team as well, but it gives clients and people the ability to, it's like a whiteboard system to write and, and, and draw on there. Um, we also, I've been using Zoom since Zoom was very young, um, Let's see, it was prior to the pandemic. I think it was 2018 when we started using Zoom, primarily for my discussions with independent contractors. Um, because I think one thing I forgot to mention, I only have one person, my original person, who's in the Bay Area. Everybody else is located all over the United States. The furthest person is in um, Virginia. Um, so I have people in Virginia. Uh, New Orleans, Michigan, uh, Ohio, um, right now. And so, uh, that thing about communicating visual concepts, uh, orally sometimes is still difficult for some people and being able to have zoom as a, as a way to discuss as well as Miro as a whiteboard before I was using Miro though, we were just 
trying to use the tools in zoom to like draw on things. <laughs> so, and I actually have some videos of, of uh, me and my, uh, and my staff, like working out a project with zoom and like <laughs> drawing on there. But, um, um, so those are good visualization tools. And, and of course, with our clients, when we're giving them the model or viewing that, um, they can, uh, they see that in the design presentation. Um, but we use, um, a software called um, Modelo IO. It's on, an online uh, uh, system that allows you to upload your model and then the client can go there and move the model. And you can also add other documents to share with clients. Um, and it also has a communication like chat box section in it. Um, uh, but our our Vectorworks now also has a product called Nomad um, that you can upload to your um, to your mobile device, and then I could send the model to the client um, to look at on the the mobile device. Very cool. Um, that that is incredible. I, now we got we got a we got to put a bullet point list of all those tools so people can sort of evaluate for themselves and, and, and see if they, it might work for them because it's certainly working for you. Um, I wanted to sort of close out with uh, more of a human aspect, right? The people, because, you know, it's, it's the, all, our business is about people. We do IT, you do architecture, but ultimately, you know, we help people and, and we hire people and we, we grow with people in our organizations. So from a team development perspective or culture development, I know you said you have contractors, but you still very uh, uh, connected with them. You know, the individuals that have been with you for a while and you like them and they like you and all that. How do you, what some of the things you've done that were successful, maybe not so successful in, in like building that team culture? Like, do you have, do you have events, you know, send gifts? What do you do? Um, I'm a big gift giver. We, we haven't really had quite a, quite a few events. Um, we, we have done like, you know, the zoom, discussion. Um, but a lot of times it's a little more compartmentalized between a me talking to the independent contractors and not so much the other independent contractors talking to each other. Mm. Um, there are some people who are, uh, um, uh, more talented in, in certain areas than another. And then I have them get together with each other and they might be doing zoom appointments, um, you know, on their own together. Um, but we're not really meeting regularly as a team um, because my projects are small enough. I can assign only one other person to the project or two other people to the project. I never need my entire team to work on a project together. So culturally, we may not have that. Um, but like I mentioned, I'm a big gift giver and I ensure that in every discussion I have, even though they're independent contractors, that I check in and make sure everybody's doing okay. You know, so it's not just a whole business discussion and then I shut the laptop or the camera off. It's, you know, we have our discussion and then it's like, how are you guys doing? You know, it always starts with the weather because everybody's all over the nation, uh -huh. right? You know, um, and just checking in that everybody's okay. Uh, feedback if in the, in the processes, um, any issues with that. So for example, um, I had one person help me make the template that we work off of in Vectorworks. And our template has a lot of instructions on it on how to utilize the template. Um, but then we created videos as well. This is on the Google Sites section. We created videos as well on how to use the template. Um, and so since she's the main expert in our template, everyone knows to talk to her if they're having any issues utilizing the, the template or where to find things. Um, so, and the template is also another thing on how I maintain consistency um, with the plans when they, the output of the plans, um, so that when it goes to the building department or the contractor, it all looks like it came from the same office mm. right? and not a series of multiple different independent contractors throwing their own title blocks on it or whatever, right? It's, it's very uh, intentional uh, in, in making sure that the J. Kretschmer Architect brand um, is visually seen the same across the board.
Yeah. That's, you know, it's a subtle thing. It's, I, but it, it's, it's, it's an important, it's an important element um, when you come across consistent and helpful as you are um, that wins business, that wins friends, that wins the best wor- you know, workers and what have you. So that, that, that really impressive, Jennifer, thank you very much for all your time. Now, if you have, if we have people in our audience who are architects who are in, in your similar position, or want to get advice from you. Um, where would you like them to connect with you? Well, I What's have the a best plug. <laughs> Go. Um, I am involved with the practice of architecture. Um, that is a group uh, started by Evelyn Lee. Um, and that practice of architecture lab, uh, we are putting out some uh, coursework on how to run a remote practice, how to run a virtual practice, how to run a hybrid practice. Uh, those courseworks will come out soon. So it's very easy to get a hold of me if you're involved in the practice of architecture. Um, I'm on our Entree Architect uh, Facebook page all the time. Um, but of course, you can always reach me at my website, jkretschmer.com. I have a form you can fill out or there's the phone number and emails on there too. That's why this uh, this was like fascinating to me that I'm I'm hearing Mark LePage's things right because we just we just had I mean we, a we 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 built the friendship uh, we advertise on these podcasts but also he came to our podcast last last week and I'm I'm like what this is kind of amazing what he talks about that you've implemented a lot of these things already and have enjoyed the success so um, that 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 is pretty impressive. Um, thank you. Thank you. I am a facilitator in one of his Entree Architect Mastermind groups. Great awesome. resource. Yeah. We'll link all of this out. Uh, Boris, did you want to say something? I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I just said how awesome that was. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. Good people stay together, learn from each other and grow together. So yeah, that- yeah. And one thing I didn't mention is prior to the pandemic, I was speaking on remote working for architects mm. at the National AIA Con- Conference on Architecture and also at the National CRAN Symposium. Um, so what what uh, Evelyn, Leah Bayer and myself have done is we have taken those sessions that I did and created a much longer version of coursework um, through the practice of architecture. And what would people find pra- practice of architecture? Is there a web address? Yeah, it's practiceofarchitecture.com. It's very Boom. long, but perfect <laughs> SEO. Perfect <laughs> SEO. Wonderful. Um, all right, Jennifer, thank you very much. Uh, lots of resources, lots of wisdom in, the, in this particular show and article. And, uh, and uh, everyone, if you're watching, you know what, take the first step, connect with Jennifer and resources she mentioned. And uh, I think that's, you know, it's very possible to be nimble, to sleep well at night and run a very successful business. Thank you everyone for watching. Um, We appreciate you and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.